What's often seen as behavior issues in a child might actually be something completely different. Kids diagnosed with ADHD are often at first seen as bad kids. But one of the nation's leading experts explains why kids who struggle with the condition can actually thrive. And we talk about what to look for to see if your child should be screened. That's today on Mom Squad. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Mom Squad, the show where we talk all things parenting. I'm Maureen Kyle, and today we are tackling a disorder that affects so many families, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, this is something that pops up as kids go back to school because their behaviors are more noticeable in the classroom. Danielle Wiggins is joining me on today's episode because she knows all about this firsthand. Mm -hmm. Now, talk to me about how you have ADHD in your household. Yeah, well, my husband, he actually had ADHD, still does, um, and he was diagnosed as a child, and then we had our first son. Mm -hmm. And um, I took him to, like, preschool, like a screening, sort of say, in our school district. They were like, oh, we're going to let a few kids in for the peer mentor program because yeah. they're trying to catch the kids early. So um, my son went through the process, and they come back, and they said, yeah, we're going to submit him or admit him to this mm -hmm. program because we think he has ADHD. Wow. And I said, I like, I thought it was a slap in the face. Yeah. And um, so I want parents to, when they hear that, just say, hey, you know, it's, it's okay. It's uh -huh. definitely okay. So I hope they take that away from this podcast. And, um, but I fought it. I said, yeah. no, he's, he doesn't have ADHD because I thought that they were trying to label him because he mm. was an African-American child, oh. black children. We, you know, hear those studies about their um, label earlier or, and they may not have it. And so I fought it and they let him in as a mentor. And uh -huh. I think they really was trying to like get around me like, yeah, we're gonna still try to treat him right. anyway. But by the time he got to the fourth grade, that's when we really started to notice mm. it and he officially got diagnosed and yeah. we got him the help that he needed. We're gonna go into that. I, I really appreciate your perspective because your husband's a teacher too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Danielle and I work together on our morning show. And so we work closely together. She's a great mom. And oh. I know you're very involved with your <laughs> kids' education. So I do want to delve into all of that because I know a lot of parents out mm -hmm. there are, are thinking when this happens, you know, there were signs and there are things that pop up and then it gets misinterpreted sometimes. Or yeah. you have that feeling of, oh no, not my child. No, I don't wanna get there. Right, yeah. And I right. don't want a label and I don't. Or you think but, it's negative, right? Like it's, oh, something is wrong with your child. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's just that they learn and do things differently. And so I think that any parent who is going through this or will go through this and have the same feelings that Danielle had will be really interested in our expert who we have here. So before we talk to Danielle more about this, who is obviously a mother and a wife affected by ADHD, I sat down with Dr. Michael Manos with the Cleveland Clinic. He is one of the nation's leading experts and I was really surprised by the reason that he thinks it's prevalent in our DNA. ADHD is a condition that is dysfunctional. There must be dysfunction. In the United States, roughly 6.1 million children have been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But what crosses the line when it comes to typical development and being diagnosed? There must be a problem in the child's being able to relate to other children or being able to do what other children are normally able to do. Dr. Michael Manos with the Cleveland Clinic is a leading expert. If a child is not able to do that, if the activity level is so excessive that it's intrusive, that it's actually interfering with the child's uh, relationships with other children or with doing what they're uh, asked to do when they're around adults, for example, then uh, it may be time to consider uh, whether or not ADHD is present. The earliest Dr. Manos says a child can be diagnosed is three years old. Earlier than that can be difficult. So that's why this time of year when kids go back to the classroom and their undivided attention is in demand, teachers and counselors start to notice if a child is having challenges. One of the very common things uh, is a child sitting in the classroom and looking out at a tree in the schoolyard and watching a squirrel in the tree. And the teacher says, children, pull out your math books and do page 45. 
the child is so busy watching the squirrel in the tree that he or she doesn't hear what the teacher has said and so ends up not doing anything. Hyperactivity is much easier to see. These are children who fidget, who move around a lot, who get out of seat. They're at dinner and they have to get up and walk. Um, they may be uh, more aggressive with uh, play and more intrusive with play. Dr. Manos says there are nine key characteristics used to identify ADHD. Impulsiveness, disorganization and problems prioritizing, poor time management skills, problems focusing on tasks, trouble multitasking, excessive activity or restlessness, poor planning, low frustration tolerance, frequent mood swings, problems following through and completing tasks, hot temper, and trouble coping with stress. If a child meets six of those characteristics, they could be diagnosed with ADHD. We already talked about the younger kids and, you know, once they start to get into school and then teachers speak up or parents start to notice some some of those behaviors. But does it ever fly under the radar? And then do you have a lot of parents and families who say this has gone on for so long and then they're more like high school age before they get diagnosed? Oh, yes. It's a very good distinction for you to bring up. So um, typically, little boys are the ones who show hyperactivity and, and impulsive behavior. So they're easily recognizable. So uh, many little girls are very bright and inattentive at the same time. So they don't have to pay attention to be able to do the tasks that they have in first grade or second grade or third grade whatever, in elementary school. And so they get by and nobody notices because they're doing just fine. Their grades are fine. They're completing their work. And they have very good social scaffolding. What that means is their parents are monitoring them and instructing them to sit down and do work when it's needed to be done or parents are assisting them. So the social scaffolding hides the presence of inattention or distractibility. So again, many times people go for uh, long periods without getting diagnosed. The oldest person that I've ever diagnosed was 74 years old. Wow. But I can't tell you the number of people who have come in to see me uh, in middle age who always felt something was wrong. They couldn't sustain their attention on, say, difficult reading or difficult study but they got by anyway because they were very, very bright. In fact, according to the CDC, adults being diagnosed with ADHD is outpacing children in the United States. A 2016 study found a 26.4% increase in children, while adults saw a 123.3% increase. So if I can point out, did you see where your eyes just went a moment ago? Yes. What were you looking at? <laughs> Somebody walked in. <laughs> So that's automatic attention. Right. <laughs> that makes so much sense. I never, it, these are things I never thought of because it just wasn't in my world. But well, so this is a very, this, so this is a very interesting point. And I'm not quite sure if you'd want to put it in the report you have, but yeah. evolutionary biologists say that if an, a condition is present in at least 1% of the population, then evolution must have selected for it over time. Mm. And ADHD's prevalence in the U.S. at the last uh, Centers for Disease Control estimates was 11% for school-aged children. That's quite high. Adult uh, prevalence is typically 4.4%. Uh, Worldwide prevalence is considered about 7.2%. So... When you consider the uh, um, comments of evolutionary biologists, then there must have been some reason why ADHD was selected for in evolution. And when you consider when we all lived in hunter-gatherer tribes, yeah. there were people who could identify or respond very quickly, just as you did a moment ago, who could respond very quickly to changes in the world around them. They could identify subtle things and react very quickly to them. Well, those were people who had ADHD. And in a study by the University of California, Irvine, uh, it followed migration patterns from South America to 
uh, up to North America, and they assessed uh, genes. And there were a very, in older sites, um, there was a high percentage of the genes associated with ADHD. After the Ice Age, people lived on farms. And so a brain that could wait a long time for something to happen, like seasons to change or plants to grow, then that brain was selected for through evolution. So farmer brains became the prevalent type. And the so I won't go into the genetic variants uh, associated with these things, but the whole global picture of uh, survival changed. So ADHD uh, presence became less and less. But people with ADHD are people who have hunter brains. Their brains automatically react to changes in the environment around, just like yours did when whoever walked by walked by. So in many ways, someone who has ADHD has advantages, just a different way to reacting to the world around them. As a parent himself, Dr. Manos has seen firsthand how a diagnosis isn't dire, sometimes it's destiny. When I married my dear wife, uh, she had a little boy named Michael. Michael was the most hyperactive child you've ever seen in your life. I remember uh, sitting with him and his legs were moving and he just said, he was talking to his mom. He said, Mommy, I just can't stop my legs. Michael would do anything if we would take him to the airport on a Saturday and allow him to lie on the hood of the car and feel the huge planes just land on the runway. He would do anything. So that was our behavioral strategy. Yeah. And uh, that young boy uh, managed his behavior effectively, but he was so good, he could look at a vapor trail of a plane and be able to tell what kind of a plane it was. Oh my goodness. Um, and he's 40, he just turned 40 years old this summer. What do you think he does for a living? Is he a pilot? He's a pilot, exactly. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> he flies He flies those huge planes. So I have to thank Dr. Michael Manos with the Cleveland Clinic again for giving us that insight. And really, when he explained the hunters and gatherers mm -hmm. mindset, um, we didn't include it in the piece. But I even told him, I, and I, I do not have a child who is diagnosed with ADHD. That doesn't matter. It doesn't mean I won't in the mm -hmm. future. My, my kids are still, I still have one in preschool. Um, but I have friends, obviously, mm -hmm. who, who go through it. And it, when he described it that way, it almost made me feel better like it's almost a sigh of relief of okay my child right. is is meant to be this way and it's it it comes out as a benefit in some ways it made sense like when you when the doctor described that because mm -hmm. i looked to my husband and i go Yep, that he would have been out there hunting. <laughs> Come here, let me get the food. Like that is his nature. Mm -hmm. And he really struggled in school. And he went to one of the top schools in Northeast Ohio. Wow. So it was really tough for him. And thank goodness for sports because he yeah. was able to play football, run track, do indoor track and get that like hyperactivity mm -hmm. out. And it didn't mean that he wasn't smart. It was just that he had to work a little harder and work differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I look to him, because right now he's in grad school and he's helping kids who have the same issues that he has as a special education teacher. He's an intervention specialist and he's getting straight A's through wow. grad school. And he's like, oh, I hate school. But he's doing so well and he's found ways to cope with, you know, something that he may lack that us who, I was book smart in school. Mm -hmm. So you can, I can regurgitate facts and mm -hmm. get straight A's. But my husband, he's very, very wise. And so he sets a great example for my son and for all the parents out there who you're like, oh, darn it, this kid just can't sit still. Yeah. Are they going to be okay? And, you know, I looked to my husband and I said, if he turned out okay, he turned out great, right. my son is going to turn out great as well. Yeah, I want to start with um, asking more about your son. Mm -hmm. um, just because one of the reasons why I even thought of this topic is because I have another friend, and, and Dr. Manos talked about how it's more prevalently diagnosed in boys mm -hmm. because girls just operate differently. But I do have a friend, a very close friend, whose daughter was recently diagnosed. Um, she's in third grade now. And um, last year she was going through this, and she said that she was relieved when she did get that diagnosis because they were having issues with 
with behavior, mm -hmm. um, with outbursts and anger. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, she so confided familiar. in me and said, gosh, you know, I used to think like, oh, I just have the bad kid, mm -hmm. which now looking back, she goes, okay, she needed just a different way of thinking and a different right. way of operating in the classroom. Do you have those moments where you see Jeremiah, you know, is that he's acting differently? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm asking this for any other parent who's mm -hmm. out there thinking, gosh, my kid just, why do they, why do they do it this way? Why do they act this way right. when they're asked to do something? So we noticed it in the first grade um, and we just thought he was just being bad, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And we're like, you're a good kid. We know he's a good kid. And so we believe the teacher and the teacher was new to the district, didn't have um, a lot of, um, let's say experience with public school kids. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, oh, Jeremiah cannot sit down. He can't sit still. He can't do this. He's always talking. He's jumping around. Like you'll see pictures and you'll see him. Jumping. <laughs> <laughs> so he <laughs> was like, Jeremiah, sit down, you know, yeah. sit down, sit still. But I realized like, no, that was how he was, you know, kind of created and crafted. Mm -hmm. And so once we got to the fourth grade, it's kind of, we punished him. And I had to apologize to him as he got older, I said, you know, I'm sorry about what happened in the first grade. We thought it was a behavior issue, mm -hmm. but it was actually just the different way. You're just wired differently. Yeah. And so by the time we got to the fourth grade and had him diagnosed and, you know, we came up with the entire team, like the teachers were there. We had a counselor. Um, he was able to put in some practices to kind of get that activity out. Mm -hmm. So like he had a stress ball that he can squeeze when he felt like, oh, 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 you know. Yeah. And he also was able to leave class. He still has that now. He's in high school now. And he was able to, if it, th things were getting overwhelmed or he saw his emotions getting like, oh, mm -hmm. he was able to take a step outside and the teacher wouldn't like, hey, you come back here and right. sit down. So there are different um, skills and different things that they can put in place to help them succeed in school. Yeah. And when we did that, he got straight A's. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And at home, do you have to adjust the way you would normally go about just routines or are think, there are there triggers at home that you notice? So for our family, we are really big on not allowing a diagnosis to be used as an excuse. Got it. So, for instance, you say, oh, I can't read this because I have ADHD. Yeah. I can't <laughs> sit still for five minutes yeah. because I have ADHD. No. Yes, you do have ADHD, but we are going to learn how to still operate in this manner so that you could be successful. OK, so you're going to have to do things mm -hmm. differently. So we still have the standard there. Mm -hmm. And so what we have done is like even at home, we'll if um, he's gotten really good at self-regulating himself, like when he oh, 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 and we're like, OK, what are we what did we talk? What did the counselor say? Take yeah. a breath, do these different things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really an extension from home to the school and everybody has to work together. Yeah. What I also found fascinating with what Dr. Manos was talking about, um, that there are so many adults that flew under the radar, especially mm -hmm. when we were growing up, mm -hmm. which is when, uh, what, what age was Chris diagnosed? Was he later or was he your husband? I, you know, it's interesting because he would say that when he was in middle school, and again, he went to a predominantly white school, so he was, again, one of the only black children. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, like, he would have to sit by the teacher's desk. Uh -huh. And so, you know, again, you don't know, it's like, are they labeling the kid? But it's like, no, he really needed the help. And yeah. so he said like all throughout um, elementary school, he was all, I mean, like if this was a teacher's desk, he He's was next. right <laughs> next to it. Yeah. And so I'm not exactly sure when they um, got him like on uh, IEP mm -hmm. and things like that. But I know by the time he hit middle school and high school, cause I, I see his IEPs from his high school career. Yeah. And how does he, does he still, have trouble um, or has he Chris or Chris does yes, Chris he does. still have trouble so what where where does he struggle like is it sitting down and focusing is it um, so it's like the reading and focusing so I say he's in grad school right mm -hmm. now and um, one thing that he learned to kind of like come around reading like sitting there and try to focus and mm -hmm. sit there and read now I can read all day and da -da 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 -da. yeah but he's learned like so now he gets audiobooks. Oh. and has the audiobook read to him 
which is helpful because then it's, it's kind of like he could be more active yeah. with it. And, or he has to read something that really interests him. Mm -hmm. So he's in a program that he's really interested in. And so he's able to kind of try to focus himself. Mm -hmm. Also, he realizes that he's trying to set an example for his son and then the children that he teach. So that he teaches. So he can't, you know, just say, ah, I got ADHD. I can't go to grad yeah. school. I can't make it through. But again, we're not going to use that as an excuse. We're just going to figure out ways to get around it. So I may not be able to walk through this door, but I can walk through that door, yeah. but I still get to the same destination. Which I think is so fascinating just because there probably are people who might be watching now mm -hmm. or um, who are out there, maybe somebody's spouse or you have a sibling that you're that never got diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Dr. Manos talks about uh, the oldest patient he ever diagnosed was in their 70s. And you think of how many people just thought that I can't do I can't do this. I can't, yeah. you know, and just never realized that maybe they needed some specialization. It's funny you say that because my pastor, um, mm -hmm. he talks about that because he, you know, he went to undergrad and he was like, I'm done with school. Mm -hmm. And his wife, who is a counselor and she, you know, she went and got her PhD and everything is doing, she's like, hmm, you know, I, I think you might have adult ADHD. Yeah. And he's like, oh, whatever. But he, and then he realized like, Yes, I do. And so then they, I'm sure they went and um, got the things that he needed to do. And now he's in grad school as well, yeah. earning his master's when he had swore off, like, I can't do grad school. Yeah. And I do want to mention, um, you know, this is something you need to talk to your doctor about, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. especially if you do get that diagnosis. It's, um, you know, I had, I had talked to Dr. Manos, who says he does not, he's not able to prescribe medication that's not his he does a lot of research mm -hmm. um, on on it but I asked because you know some people say medication versus therapy what works best for them I think that's something that you need to figure yes. out with your doctor we are not here to tell you how to go about treating ADHD but I, and you don't have to disclose Danielle I'm not going to make you disclose <laughs> who's, on, who's taking what or right. what the way you decided to approach it but do you feel like um like you mentioned the stress ball Mm -hmm. Are there ways to uh, just readjust thinking? Like, I love the analogy you just used of, I can't go through that door, but I can go through this. Have you found that, that tricks like that mm -hmm. work and help navigate life just in a different way of thinking? So for us, when it comes to Jeremiah, our, our oldest son, mm -hmm. he, we realize that he does extremely well when he has somebody that he can just talk to mm -hmm. and get everything out that he's thinking and he's, I mean, he will talk and talk and you're like, what, what, you know, yeah. <laughs> this green thing over there, da, da, da. you know, yeah. he talks and talks and talks and he does well, but that doesn't work in the classroom when the teacher <laughs> is trying to teach. And so we've learned that counseling really helps in the school setting. So mm -hmm. we set him up with either the guidance counselor where he goes and speaks or, you know, they have counselors that come into the schools now to help with mental health. So he goes and talks and he does well um, doing that. And, and again, it's all about teaching him and we have him in sports. And we don't really care if he's good or not good mm -hmm. at the sports, but we're having him there so he learns how to regulate his emotions. Yeah. So, okay, you're falling behind. Don't quit. Don't give up. How do you push through so that you can overcome these obstacles and turn them into opportunities for yeah. yourself? Do you see, with your son, Jeremiah, do you see um, an area where he is, he's able to channel his energy. Yes. And he is passionate about where you could see him that's becoming his career or his life work. Animation. Wow. He loves animation. He draws and does different things. His room is full of his drawings that he has done. And I hate it because I'm like, oh, you're peeling off the paint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With this. But it's like, no, I'm going to let him express this. It's his room. And so he has these different drawings yeah. all around and cars. He will tell you about, we'll drive, we'll drive down the street and he can, and that's a 1964 Mustang. And oh, wow. that has a, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I just realized that as a mother, I have to listen to him when mm -hmm. he's talking and not like, I don't care about that car. Yeah. <laughs> but he's, you know, just taking interest into the things that he is and that he loves. And, you know, you really see is like, oh, OK, 
mom and dad are, are here for me, mom and dad, yeah. yeah, they fight with me, they push me, mm -hmm. but they're also here to support me. So you yeah. gotta love them just as much as you push them, even actually more than yeah. you push them at yeah. times. Well, he'll give you a ride in the 1964 <laughs> Mustang when he, he right. animates a hit Pixar movie. I told him, I in said, the we really think he will, should be a um, car engineer, but he's like, I don't want to be an engineer. I want to yeah. be an animator. But yeah. yeah, so. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Well, Danielle, this was great perspective. And I'm sure a lot of parents out there who maybe they will go through the same thing. Maybe they are going through the same mm -hmm. thing. Maybe they are adults wondering, oh my gosh, maybe this was me my whole life. Your perspective has really helped, so I really want to thank you well, for thank joining you. us thank today. You. Thank it's you. always fun to talk to Danielle. And thanks to all of you for watching Mom Squad. And next week, we are going to go in depth about something that every parent is concerned about, bullying and how it can lead to depression in kids. We're going to hear from a teenage girl about her struggle, how she overcame it, and what signs to watch for in your child. That's next week on Mom Squad. See you then.